Uh, g'day, my name's David Denborough and I'm here at Dulwich Centre uh, on Ghana land. Beautiful Ghana land and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Elders past and present. I'd like to particularly acknowledge Auntie Barbara Wingard, uh, who's a senior Ghana elder and also a key person in the field of narrative therapy and community work, which I'll be speaking about today. If you were here, you'd be able to go on a bit of a walk, actually, around Dulwich Centre and around the southeast corner of the parklands. Um, there's a walking history journey now called the Auntie Barb Walk. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, invitation to see this part of Adelaide through the eyes of Auntie Barb, and it's spoken by her daughter and her grandson. Now, there's actually an app that I'll put a link to so that you can do this virtually. So that even though you can't be here um, and I can't be with you, there is a way that you can uh, hear the stories that Ghana elder Adi Bab wants to share of the histories around here. They're particularly carefully chosen stories and the ways that they're shared is very deliberate because Adi Bab uh, believes in telling our stories in ways that make us stronger. This was the name of the book that Adi Barbara and Jane Lester put out uh, some years ago. But the same principle has been applied to the histories around here. So it's telling histories also in ways that make uh, uh, people stronger. And in this case, their histories in relation to the Aboriginal um, struggles, but also resistances and um, great achievements all around this part of what's now known as Adelaide. I want to also acknowledge the organisers of this conference. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of it. Of course, the field of family therapy uh, is very precious to all narrative practitioners because this is where narrative therapy emerged from. Uh, I also want to thank the organisers for choosing this topic, um, distances and focusing on the experiences of uh, displacement and people making new homes and connections, such a crucial theme. So I am looking forward to spending this 45 minutes with you and then being able to respond to questions uh, afterwards. That would be great. I've also asked some guests to join me, some Afghani friends and colleagues, because when thinking about displacement, refuge, asylum, and making new homes, of course, the people of Afghanistan know a lot about this throughout their long history, but also the current uh, crisis that's been taking place has seen some uh, profound initiatives, and Fariba Ahmadi and Dr. Abdul Ghaffar Stanigzai are going to join me a little bit later on to share some of the ways that they've been using narrative practices uh, to respond to profound hardship, to welcome people, and to assist people when grappling with um, the oceans of depression. Anyway, many things. They'll be here shortly. So that's one of the great advantages of going online. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So you'll get to meet them in a minute. Before that, I want to share one family therapy story that looks a little bit different, perhaps, than um, other forms of family therapy, but I, I think very much of it in that light. It's linked to one uh, young boy, 11-year-old boy, who came to meet with me, with his mum, and I didn't know much at all about what this family was grappling with, but I'd been called by someone from the education department to see if I could meet with them. It was a bit unusual for me to get this call because usually I'm involved in uh, community projects, collective narrative practice with uh, groups of people rather than working with a uh, family or a young boy and his mum. But this colleague at the education department had called me up and so I knew things were a little bit urgent and I said, sure, come and meet. Now, the only thing I knew actually about this uh, young guy was that he loved football because we had to fit this appointment in between the training camps that he was doing in the school holidays. So 
I knew that. I didn't know what the problems were. But I thought that's enough to start with. The reason I thought that is that I've been taught that by actually uh, young people in many different contexts, but in one in particular in Uganda, where we were asked to travel, a team from Dulwich Centre Foundation was asked to travel to Uganda to assist colleagues there to try to find a way of responding to um, young people who'd been involved in the uh, civil war there. Uh, These were young people who'd been recruited to fight uh, in this war and they were now living in a refugee camp in the north of Uganda. And when we got there, they were playing football. Now, um, by football, they didn't mean the AFL version. This is the soccer, the round ball version. Everything's uh, uh, quite complicated in these realms. Anyway, they were playing football, and they were playing with grace and delight and verve and teamwork. And they were celebrating each other's goals. And this was when we were first driving into the refugee camp. And it seemed pretty clear that this was actually a social achievement, that if you've been through profound hardship but are finding ways to relate to people that are, at least for a time, keeping problems of memory at bay, uh, then something pretty significant is going on. Uh, We might call it sport, but actually it can be more than that in some contexts, and this was one of them. So then these young people got called over because we'd arrived and they were asked to sit under a tree and they were then invited to speak in the first person about the hardships that they'd been through. And I think this was because of uh, actually a form of psychological colonisation. It was because we as Westerners were there and it was somehow expected that we'd have some sort of psychosocial group and that therefore people would speak in the first person about their hardships. Um, But when this started to happen, the entire atmosphere changed. Everything that had been apparent between these young people on the football field was now nowhere to be seen. And instead, it was as if a sense of shame uh, was enveloping all of us, I think, to some degree, because I felt pretty ashamed that um, somehow... Uh, young people were being asked to speak in ways that clearly wasn't helpful for them. Um, And problems of memory seemed pretty clearly to be now present where they weren't just before. And this experience was profoundly challenging to me. Um, I thought there's got to be a better way than this. Surely we can learn from what the young people were just showing us They were showing us there was some aspect of local folk cultural life. In this case, it's the sporting realm that was what I'm calling folk cultural life. Some ritual, something they were doing, something that was lighting up their eyes. Um, Surely we can use that realm of life to shape our practice, um, to be the basis of our practice. So that takes me back to this young guy who I don't know what's going on for him, but I know he loves football. And so I thought we could use the team of life approach. The team of life approach is a way of, in this case, a form of family therapy, but thinking about who is this young person's team? If he was to imagine his life, his identity, as if it was a team, in this case, a football team, because that's what this young guy loves, then who would be its members? Who would be the goalkeeper? The person protecting his goals, um, his hopes. Uh, Who would be the coach, a person alive or no longer alive, who might uh, have offered guidance to him? Anyway, you get the idea. I asked this young guy to start uh, drawing a team sheet with all these members, whoever these people were. And I'm going to show you a short video clip now um, of describing what happened in that one session that we had with this young guy, his mum, and the person from the education department. 
And through this metaphor of a team of life, through a team of life family therapy, uh, we traveled quite a distance. Um, and I eventually learnt why we were there. So here we go. I'll play this clip and um, talk to you about it afterwards. I'm 11 years old. I've been playing football since I was four. I'm currently at a Barcelona camp, even though I support Real Madrid. My mum says she has photos of me when I was only one, probably still not walking but kicking the ball. This is my team of life. If you look closely, you might see that my coaches are my mum and dad. They have taught me to look after myself and care about others. They teach me in a fun way. They are good coaches. They have probably learned how to look after themselves and care about others from their parents. My goalkeeper is my bracelet and my wooden cross. They protect me. They make me feel safe in hard situations. When I take my bracelet off, it makes me feel bad. It connects me to my religion. My brother, my cousins and my friend are all in the back line. They always stick up for me. And I'm in the midfield. I'm the captain with the C next to me. My dad is right next to me. In the midfield, we need to think before. We need to predict what might happen next and we need to be allowed to really communicate with all the other players. The wingers bring the ball forward. My auntie is always there. She's always doing things. She makes fun for me. On the other wing is my grandpa. He always says kind things about me. And there are the strikers, the ones who score the goals. My favorite strikers are Suarez and Vardy. On my team of life, I have two strikers. One of my strikers are the actual soccer ball. It's a very important part of my team. It keeps me free from freedom. I have uh, one favourite soccer ball and it came from my mum and dad for my birthday. I'm going to keep it forever. It's an official match ball. My other striker is school. School helps me. I need to be smart. School helps me in life. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just interrupt here for a moment because up until this point, you'll see that this young guy has created his team sheet. Who is his team of life? Um, the next step is I want to ask, what is one goal that this team has already scored? So not a future goal and not an individual goal necessarily, but one goal that this team has already scored. We're trying to evoke a heritage of achievement. And it was only in asking this question that I started to get a glimpse of maybe why I'd been called and maybe why we were meeting. The name of the club is Stay Strong FC or Budiak Fuka in Serbian. We have scored some important goals. One important goal we have scored is coming together after a fight. One of the things that Stay Strong FC is about is caring about others. So we try not to fight with friends. If we do have a fight with a friend, we try to get back together again. We have strategies for this. Notice if your friend is starting to get angry with you, walk away, don't talk, apologise, try to forget about the bad things, be good again, try not to have a fight again anymore, be good friends for a long time. These are our strategies from coming together after a fight and stopping fighting from getting worse. We have seven strategies, like seven aside. I think these strategies are important for everyone, and so does my mum. Here is a goal map about coming together 
after a fight. It shows how we scored this goal. When I score a goal, I celebrate by trying even harder. And we never give up at the end. Okay, so it was only after this past goal had been achieved that then we might look into the future. And when we looked into the future and this young guy named his future hopes, this is when his mother started to get very uh, keen on this process. At the beginning, I think she was probably like, oh, do we have to talk about football again? I imagine there's a lot of talk about football in this family already. But at this point, when I ask what's a future goal for this team, that uh, she seemed to think this was pretty significant. The next goal for Stay Strong FC is to turn a small thing into a big thing. The next goal is good behaviour at any place. In football, you need to train to be the best. So we also need to train for good behaviour. We have four different training exercises. Calm your nerves. Don't get angry at people, just ignore them. Be kind and share stuff with people. If there are any other people who are trying to achieve this goal, we have a special idea for a training exercise to calm your nerves. Get your coach to give you something really hard to do and do the exercise and try not to get angry if you can't do it. This is a good way for calming your nerves. While you're doing this exercise, don't think about negative stuff. Just think about succeeding. This is Stay Strong FC and I'm 11 years old. I think it's a good team with lots of different combinations. And if you are trying to have good behaviours at any place, or if you are trying to come back after fights, I hope our ideas were helpful for you. Okay, so that's an example of what can be achieved when we are joining with people in the realms of life where they have a rich vocabulary. This young guy has a rich vocabulary in the realm of sports. Um, and he came up with some fantastic ideas, didn't he? Training exercises, uh, different initiatives, all these things within this aspect of local folk culture that could be put to work to address the struggles, the problems. Now, when this film was then made, uh, there was a launch, and of course all the family came. Uh, it was a bit of a community event, actually, because this story doesn't just uh, acknowledge the young man, it actually is an example of intergenerational honouring. It's honouring his efforts, but also all his family efforts, all this team of life, and that's pretty crucial in this approach. So. Um, I'd be really interested in your thoughts about this approach, this uh, different approach to family therapy, and um, perhaps we can talk a bit about that in the Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, well, thank you so much, Reba, for joining me so that I'm not by myself giving this presentation to people um, who are listening in uh, for this conference. And it's been a terrible time for people from Afghanistan, both in the diaspora and um, in Afghanistan during these past months. And so I really appreciate you coming in and sharing how you have been responding, because you have been doing so many things. First of all, I would like to say hi to everyone and thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you for acknowledging the situation in Afghanistan and thanks for all your support. Um, when the crisis started in Afghanistan, I've got uh, many phone calls from different schools, um, especially from Adelaide Secondary School of English, because there are lots of uh, new arrival students are attending this school. And they asked me for support uh, because lots of the students were crying, uncomfortable, distressed, couldn't cope to stay at the, in the class, focus on their study. And um, they were, um, most of them, they were crying. Uh, why did it happen? And why there was no one to prevent that? So they had, um, yes, profound questions to be asking you. 
That's right. I know you also chose, you know, not to go in um, with your own ideas about what would be good for these children and young people. You also went in with some questions. You went in to consult, That's to right. consult them. I'd love to hear more yes. about uh, how you did that and why you did that. Yes, before I go, I thought it's better to um, arrange or organize or prepare some questions to have an idea like what type of question I might ask this uh, students. Uh, I, I think um, I asked the student uh, a question like, how has the arrival this, of this crisis uh, changed your life? Mm. And um, everyone was um, coming with different ideas, but I've um, put some in that document. You might uh, be able to have a copy and read these um, answers. But um, in general, the, the answer was, um, I'm sad, uh, I'm worried, I'm worried about the future of Afghanistan, um, uh, that what, what, what is going to happen. Um, I'm also worried about my sister, but not just um, about my sister, about the whole people in Afghanistan. Um, hearing this um, feeling from a child, uh, like 13 or 12 or um, 11 years old, it, it's, it's quite a strong, it uh, has got deep meaning that they are not um, only thinking about themselves, they are thinking about the whole nation. Um, that was really, um, for me, um, giving me even the strength to be with them, to listen to them, and uh, to s support them there. Okay, and I, I, I know you, so that was the first one to get a sense of what the effects of this uh, crisis right. were, and what, yeah, what was the next theme that you asked them about? Uh, the next question that I asked the student was, if you could give this crisis a name or nickname, what would it be? That's such an interesting question. Yes. So if you give it a name or a nickname, would you, what were you thinking in asking that question? Um, uh, from the experience that I've learned um, during my study at the um, Dalish Centre, that was the best way to externalise the problem in the way that they were thinking. And to see like, um, what's their idea. But, um, they were really clever. They came with the idea of, uh, they said, I might say, darkness, misery, uh, killing, fighting, pain, misfortune, destruction, destruction of the country, killing innocent people. Um, that was, again, profound answers mm. uh, to come from that age group uh, who had been here only for a few months and less than a year. Um, I could see like still the connection was there. You've um, found a way to be sharing uh, some of the sorrow or great hardship in this group. You've then found a way for them to give a, some names or nicknames for this. What, what did you do next? Then um, I asked them another question. I said, um, I've given them the opportunity that you don't have to um, exactly answer uh, in writing or in English. You can talk to me, you can write in diary. And I've noticed like most of the students even uh, started to write in diary very fluently uh, with big explanation, large explanation and very meaningful. Mm. That was a great idea too. So they could either speak or they could write That's and right. write in you know, whatever right. their preferred yeah. language was. That's yeah, okay. right. And the next question that I asked on the day was, um, what have you learned about yourself that makes you believe um, you are able to cope with this situation? So. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but that's a really interesting question too. Why, why did you ask that question? I wanted to actually know that um, which skills or knowledge or ability that they are using to cope with the situation mm. themselves and uh, what kind of uh, support they might be giving or receiving from others. Um, that was the next question. But for the first question, their answer was, um, they said, like, I need to work hard and I need to control myself and when I became older, I need to help Afghanistan. Mm. They also said they were trying to be patient and hopeful. And that one day everything will get better. They also spoke about the importance of being united with each other, to support each other, and to be persistent. Um, that was really like uh, blown me out when I read the question, came back home. I was deeply thinking about their feeling and I really acknowledge and appreciate like the way that they've been thinking and supporting each other. Mm -hmm. Not only within the school, even uh, within their family and the community. And some of them uh, mentioned that they've been in contact with their friends back home. And they are talking on the phone with their friends, even supporting them. Uh, that I'm here in Australia, but I will help you mm -hmm. whenever, whenever that you need. You can call me, mm -hmm. you can contact me. 
And so you'd um, found a way to share the hardships, but now you're also uh, exploring a second storyline, the ways that these young people are responding, the actions they're taking, the skills they're using. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Um, as uh, we've learned, like, uh, you can see, like, uh, they were trying to be the expert of their life. The spot they are struggling is uh, in, in here with the um, new culture, new life, new schooling, new language, everything. It's mm -hmm. still like uh, they were having the ability to support uh, their friends and families uh, back in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Okay, great. What, yes, what, what came next? Um, the next question was, what do you suggest to other Afghans who are dealing with this situation? And uh, they said, uh, please don't think too so much. Mm. Be brave and be strong. Um, it was a very strong message. Um, even um, as an adult, when I read this question, that was a kind of therapy for me. Kind of to, therapy for you? That's right. Mm. We decided to do a banner. Mm. And uh, everyone was um, allowed on the day to um, write um, their feelings in Dari, English, mm. and um, we used the um, three color of our flag, um, green, um, red, and black, and they painted their hand and put their handprint there. Mm. They felt so relieved. Thank you. And there was then an event that uh, week wasn't there, like a vigil, uh, I believe, that the school also sent that banner uh, to. And I'd learnt later that the, where that vigil happened, it was just across the road from the hotel where people were quarantining. So the okay. people who had just arrived from Afghanistan could actually see this uh, banner and the actions that these kids were taking. Um, that, that is it's really, really message. important. Yeah, That's really good message. for other children. And I guess people who are listening in uh, from different uh, parts of Australia, if you also want to send any message, I'll leave my email and I can forward any of those uh, onto Fariba and you'll be heading, yes, back into Adelaide Secondary School at some stage and continuing Hopefully, your yes, work. Soon. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Thank you so much um, for inviting me today. And thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy reading this project. Thanks for Eva. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure now to also be able to hear about a, a different project, also led by members of the uh, Afghan diaspora community. And Dr. Abdul Ghaffar Stanigzai, great that you could join us. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Thank you. For... And Dr. Stanigzai, who I uh, often refer to as Dr. Cricket, because actually we met first in the Kenilworth Cricket Nets, where uh, Dr. Cricket was bowling his very skillful leg spin. Um, anyway, that's a different story. But I also came to learn that uh, Dr. Cricket used to be involved in the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, actually documenting human rights abuses in Afghanistan, abuses by uh, the Taliban, abuses by uh, Afghan uh, government forces, and abuses by Australian forces and other uh, uh, foreign forces in Afghanistan, documenting profound um, atrocities and hardships to try and uh, bring about some justice in relation to those. Um, that's a long story and one that is very relevant to us here in Australia as of course as a nation Australia is also trying now to mm. grapple with um, the war crimes that occurred in Afghanistan. Um, and when I met uh, Dr Cricket and then learnt about these things um, we learnt we uh, shared many uh, commitments in common and one of them was also to respond to people who are suffering uh, here in Australia. And there's a particular project that Dr Cricket's been involved in that I'd really like him to be able to share with people today.
because I think it might be really relevant to many of you who are trying to work out how to respond when people are uh, sometimes drowning or really suffering uh, in oceans of depression. And um, yeah, it'd be great for people to hear how, how you came to be involved in this, this particular project. Because yes. it was when you were working as an interpreter, is yes. that right? So when I was working as an interpreter, one day I was uh, asked to do a job at the old Royal Adelaide Psychiatry Emergency Unit. Uh, when I get there, uh, usually it was very unusual for me because in Afghanistan, uh, we don't have many psychiatric units. Mm. That was too security strictly uh, observed. Mm. When I get there, there was two young Afghans. Mm, they were restrained mm. and uh, mm, they were trying to go out and they said, we are good, we are okay, but they were not, the doctor was not letting them to go out. And then even security guard intervened and they said, no, you can't. And uh, so the story was, um, they were trying to seek asylum in Australia mm. and uh, they ended up to be in detention center for many years and they were mm. transferred to different uh, detention centers. So during uh, their uh, detention time they were more stressed, they were depressed and uh, after several years they were released to the community. Once they were released to the community they said our stress and despair even grows up and finally they tried to commit suicide. So mm. I was really, really moved when I, when I saw them. They were very young. They mm. were not in the age because they had a very long life ahead. And uh, I was thinking, like, everything was coming into my mind. Like, I was an interpreter, but, uh, you know, I just uh, forgot that I'm an interpreter. I was just thinking mm. about my past, about the people that I worked in Uruzgan, in Afghanistan. And uh, the psychiatrist, I think she was a lady. She was also struggling to get the information and to, to get the proper background history. Uh, as a doctor, I was feeling for that psychiatrist as well because yes. she should have a very uh, detailed history about how they commit and how to heal. Mm. And uh, then uh, that day we finished and then um, I approached uh, Dollis Center and I met you and uh, then I said, oh, it's really important to have to create or initiate a project. Maybe it might be a very simple thing, but I think it would mean a lot. Uh, so then we came up with some questions and uh, then my role... Yeah, we decided that you also knew yourself. Many other people you knew had also been through some really yeah. tough times once you'd come to Australia. So yeah. you thought that you could go and interview yeah, so that's uh, people the, and gather, gather their ideas? And then, yeah, so yeah. that's what I thought. Even when I was there in that say, emergency psychiatry unit, I was just thinking about, uh, because I met people, they, they had the same hard time while they came to Australia, but mm. how they overcome without going to mental health hospitals or yes. without doing any harm to themselves and things like that. So then uh, when we created question and then I went to interview those people who were struggling one um, sometime. They when used they to be struggling and have found a way through. You'd yes. interview them to get their stories and their knowledge as yes. a way of sharing it. Yep. And uh, while I was doing that, again, I was uh, assigned to a job to this time to Glenside Mental Hospital. Uh, uh, ironically, when I went there, I met again these two people. Mm their face was pale and they looked very, um, like not in a normal shape. Mm. And uh, 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 later on I realized they got uh, ECT, uh, um, um, a treatment, mm. and also somehow they forgot in their memory, they lost their memory. And mm. that was even more uh, mm. sudden for me, even as an interpreter, I was really traumatized. And, Mm. Then I tried to focus more on these resources to interview. Then I went from here to another state, to Melbourne, and there's a big Afghan community, Dandenong, I met. Uh, like, I knew people that they were also struggling, and then I m interviewed them. So once we collected those uh, interviews, that was quite mm. powerful um, stories. Yeah. It seems uh, very simple, but, you know, those who are struggling, mm. um, when, even when I was reading back, 
the interviews, uh, sometimes when I was alone, I was crying. Mm. Like how people, like they are coming to, to, to seek refuge, they are coming to seek protection, but they are ending up with, uh, with something unexpected, like they are trying to, mm. to, you know, to do some harms for themselves, mm. even with their age. It's, it's a beautiful document, and I will share the link so that people can uh, either read it or it's also now been turned into audio resources in m multiple languages. But maybe just to give people a sense, mm -hmm. I'll just read the first uh, paragraph or two. Mm -hmm. What do you sure. think? So it's called Surviving the Ocean of Depression. Country means to us like mother. If you leave your country, it's like leaving your mother. So there is always a vital reason behind that. We left our country based on a life-threatening situation. We were searching and asking for protection. We were chasing peace. Um, and then it goes on to tell many different stories. Um, it says, we want to share with you some of the ways we have survived despair or depression or worry. These are our stories, ideas and messages. They are stories from men and from women from older people and from younger people, because Afghan mm. Youth SA also helped out. Mm. If you are drowning, we hope our words reach out to you. And then there are these themes, these special ways that people have tried to mm. uh, survive the ocean of depression. Water can bring you fresh ideas. And there's a story about uh, water and the beach, taking refuge in the past. My friends smile making my body tired so my mind can forget, remembering and learning from my ancestors. Anyway, you get the idea. There are many others of these uh, significant stories that you uh, gathered through your uh, interviews. Yes. Um, and then we, you turned them into uh, audio resources. Yes, and uh, once we decided now it's uh, enough resources, and. Uh, because most of the Afghan, they are illiterate, and uh, especially when it's come to English, they can't even read or write or things like that. So then, um, even uh, in their own language, some are illiterate, they can't even read their own language. So then uh, we tried, like we thought how we can do to make it um, readable, make it available, make it easier for people who, uh, who really want, need this type of resources. And then we came up with an idea to convert this to the audio resources, then everyone can listen to it. Well, thank you, Dr. Cricket, and thank you for continuing your human rights work. First of all, started in Afghanistan, now it's continuing here in Australia. So, My pleasure. Oh. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Cricket. Thank you. Now, in collective narrative practice, I'm incredibly interested in enabling contribution, finding how one group or one individual can make contributions to someone else by sharing their insider knowledge. And I think you will have got that sense through each of the stories that um, I've been sharing today and that Fariba and Dr. Cricket were sharing also. And they were very, very interested in how they could possibly welcome the next wave of arrivals. And I could ask them questions about, well, what would you want to say to them? Uh, what have you learnt about some of the struggles in terms of coming to a new land? Which parts of Adelaide would you want to welcome them to? What stories would you want to share with them? And so I started consulting these young people about how they would welcome the next uh, group of new arrivals. And in turn, this process actually made them realise that actually they had learnt things, that they weren't in the same position they were in the past, that they did have certain ideas that they could keep using themselves as well as actions they could take uh, for others. So we then made a short welcoming film, and that's what I want to end this uh, presentation on. Hi, we are a group of young Syrians and friends from other countries who arrived as refugees in Adelaide last year. 
Some of us have already made many new friends here. Some of us are still looking for friends. And some of us are really missing our friends back home. When we first arrived to Adelaide, we realized this is a very quiet city. In the Middle East, there is much more noise and life in that night. We got lost so many times. It was really hard for us at first. Even time is different here. Australians are very accurate about time. But in Syria, a lot of people do not go to places at the exact time or accurate time. We kept saying to ourselves, we know that it's completely different here to where we came from. So we need to adapt. Many things were a big struggle. We are happy to share our stories of how we are trying to make a new life here in Adelaide. We hope this is helpful. One of the first steps was learning to find our way around and not to get lost. We used Google Maps a lot. After the first couple of months, we started to know our suburb. And then how to use the bus to go to the city. And then how to go to our school by ourselves. Then we started to try to make friends and to learn English. Spending time at Marion Shopping Centre was good too. In our first couple of months, we did not know any other Syrian families here. We did not know anyone at all. So, instead of staying at home all the time, we tried to go to Marion shops and to the library sometimes. We would speak to people working in the shops. That's how we would practice our English, just asking about things. It was also good to discover some beautiful places like Adelaide Oval and the river especially at night, the beautiful lights and at Mount Lofty. We went to a camping excursion there and got to know the land. There are a lot of beautiful colors there. Glenelg, the beach is really nice. When you arrive, we will introduce you to all the other Syrian young people here. We will look out for you. And you can start looking out for people who one day might become your friends. We would like to tell you that Australia is a beautiful place. It is like our country. When you arrive, we will take you to taste the ice cream at McDonald's. It is very creamy and nice. When you first arrive, you will probably miss your friends. We miss our friends back in Jordan very much. At first, you may have difficulties with the language, but remember, we are safe here and the people are friendly. This gives us hope that there is life to live. At first, you might feel lost, but we can feel safe from war here. It's a place where you can achieve your dreams. When we first arrived, it was like a dream. This dream has been in our head for so long and we could not believe we had made it. Then, slowly, slowly, we started to miss our country and we started to miss talking in Arabic. When you arrive, you will probably feel many different things at different times. The first thing that we will show you when you arrive is how to get your driver license. It is very different process here. It is exciting to get your license. We will show you how to take the bus. Even if you have no English, you can take the bus. We will help you with translation. We think it's good to remember that wherever you go, wherever you are, the most beautiful place will always be your country. We have been here in Adelaide for some months now. These are some of the ways we want to welcome you. We are waiting your arrival with warmth from your soon-to-be friends at Adelaide Secondary School of English. Of course, if we're thinking about welcoming and welcoming to country, actually it's the First Nations people of this land uh, who uh, we can and should turn to. So this film project or this project in relation to welcoming new arrivals, um, it culminates 
in a message from Curtis Feller, uh, Ghana and Naranga man, and Talia Drum Butler, a key uh, Aboriginal narrative practitioner and member of the Dulwich Centre faculty. So I'm going to end this presentation with their message that they made back to the young Syrians. And um, I also find this very powerful, and I look forward to talking with you uh, in the Q&A. Thanks so much for joining. Salam alaikum. Here in Ghana, it's Nina Mani. Which way? Which way means, hello, how are you? Where are you going? What are you doing? Nina Mani, Nyankana Mena, Naumani. Nai Nari, Curtis. Mary Chunga Ghana Mena. Mani Nabudni, Ghana Yara Ana. Narajo Tapaninti Natalia. Hello everyone, how are you? My name is Curtis, I'm a Naranga and Ghana man, and I'd like to welcome everyone here today. We're meeting on Ghana land, and I'd like to welcome everyone here today. My name's Talia, I'm a Durumbul Kalali and Wanyamaja Yirinji woman, which is in Queensland, Australia. And I thank Curtis for welcoming us to Ghana land uh, because Adelaide, the first people of Adelaide were Ghana people, the Aboriginal people here. So the reason we do welcome to the country is to not only pay respects to the Ghana people and the land that we are on, the Ghana land, but also to wish everyone well in coming into our lands. So this isn't something that's new, it's just something that's been done for thousands of years. Yeah. And so we are a welcoming people and we like to do this not only to pay respects but to wish you well coming through our land and wish you good things and so this is why we do it and we welcome you. And we know that sometimes not everybody is welcoming uh, but as Curtis said we're a welcoming people and, and we wish that we were put in positions to be able to be the ones that, that welcome people when they, when they get to our countries. It's, it's really a privilege to be welcomed by Curtis and by Ghana people. Some of the things that we talked about that stood out about the movie was, um, for me, about time. And you talked about having to learn a different sense of time. And what I'd like to say is that maybe it's a good idea to just hold that time a little bit loosely. Because in Queensland we talk about Murray time. and In Ghana we talk about Nunga time. And so with Murray and Nunga time, you know, we claim time. We, we like to use time for good things, time for family, time for speaking language and doing culture, time for ourselves and, and time to heal. So, And it's on. not always about being at one location at one time. It's about taking the time and what's important to us. So we may not be there on time because we've got important things that we've got to be looking at. But in the same time, we might be there half an hour, an hour early because it is so important that we are there. <laughs> That's so right. looking at that, the fluidness yeah. of time. And I also really liked in your movie that you, you talked about the most beautiful place will always be your country. And that was a really lovely thought for me that, that you will always carry your countries in your heart, mm. uh, that you will continue to speak your language because your language is your culture. Uh, thank you for sharing the video. Uh, good luck with your journey. And so what we say here is Nakatha. So we don't like to say goodbye. We like to say this word, which is Nakatha, which means we'll see you next time because we welcome you here. Thank you. Nakatha. Nakatha. <laughs>